Champion is the word. Champion. <laughs> Champion indeed. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Professor Fladek, who I'm sure his last time was probably not interested in me providing a long introduction of him, but needless to say, he's um, an, an expert on many of the issues that are before the court this term. He's a professor of law at American University's Washington College of Law with um, special expertise in national security and constitutional law. And he also serves as the Supreme Court Fellow for the Constitution Project. So with that, um, I will turn it over to you. I think we were starting with some key decisions that have been issued already. Yeah. And, and starting with Yates and the, which is full, I guess, of all kinds of metaphors for, to, to fishermen and fishing. Um, all right, well, thanks, Sarah. Thanks to all of you for coming. Um, we've been doing this now for the better part of six years uh, with the support and guidance of Congressman Scott and his colleagues. Um, and the idea is just to have periodic briefings so that folks um, can stay abreast of what's going on in the Supreme Court, of uh, some of the important decisions, of uh, some of the cases that aren't in the headlines, um, and just sort of keep track and keep tabs on the court. Before I actually get into the specifics of this term, I thought I'd offer a couple of general comments about the court's workload. Um, just if you're not a, a close watcher of the court, we're really getting into the busy season. Um, so the Supreme Court has had all but one of its argument sessions for the cases it's going to hear this term, the term that began back in October. Um, but it's only handed down really a very small number of the decisions we're expecting. We've gotten about 15 decisions from the Supreme Court so far this term. Um, and I can, I'll, I'll say none of them are really that significant compared to what we're expecting during the rest of the term. Um, the court only has uh, seven more argument days, um, and it's only hearing about um, 11 or 12 more cases this term, um, and those will be in a couple weeks in April. Um, and instead, what we're really gearing up for is the remaining decisions, of which there are about 50 um, between now and the end of June. Um, one sort of brief comment on workload. So if you guys have been to one of these briefings before, you've probably heard me say, um, every year the Supreme Court is deciding fewer and fewer cases. Uh, this year is no exception. Um, the court is poised to uh, hand down what are called merits decisions in only 68 cases this year. Um, if you follow the statistics, um, for a long time in the 1990s and early part of the 2000s, the average was closer to 85 a year. Um, that ticked down into the mid-70s, early in Chief Justice Roberts' tenure, um, and in the last four or five years, it's actually really consistently dipped below 70. Um, and so it's trending downwards. That's not because there aren't plenty of important and interesting cases out there. Um, rather, it's probably a reflection on how deeply divided the court is right now. Um, and so the justices really aren't taking as many cases because they're just not sure where their colleagues are. Um, and by colleagues, I mean Justice Kennedy, uh, who is increasingly on almost every major question uh, the swing vote. So uh, the court is doing less and less insofar as volume. This is also true with regard to looking ahead to next term. So the court is done taking cases for this year. Um, any new cases now won't be put on the argument calendar until the fall. Keep that in mind, especially for the Texas lawsuit against the United States um, challenging the uh, DAPA and DACA uh, programs from the Obama administration. Um, those won't be heard until the earliest October. Um, instead, what we're going to see now is arguments. The court's also way behind in granting cases for next term. Uh, there are only five cases on the court's docket so far for uh, the 2015-2016 term. That's much lower than usual and much, much lower than is typical um, for March. Anyway, so in short, they're working less. Um, make of that what you will. Some people would say that's not a bad thing. Um, let me turn, as Sarah suggested, to um, three important decisions the court has handed down already. Hopefully everyone was able to pick up a copy of the beautiful, colorful handout. Um, thank you, American University, for giving me a color printer. Um, the three cases that I'm focusing on among the decisions so far, um, I'm just going to walk through briefly in reverse chronological order. Um, the first, if you're going to read one Supreme Court opinion this term, let me encourage you to read this first one, not because it's important, but because it's entertaining. Um, so Yates versus United States is the fish case that Sarah was referring to already. Um, to make a long story short, there's a federal criminal statute, it's 18 U.S.C. section 1519, that makes it illegal um, to destroy evidence, basically to thwart a federal investigation. Um, it's basically kind of like an obstruction charge. Um, and it says what you cannot destroy are, quote, records, documents, or tangible things. 
unquote. Well, Yates um, was, arrest, was, was basically caught fishing illegally um, in an area where there was no legal fishing or where he had sort of exceeded his permit, and so he got rid of the fish he had caught um, to basically deprive the government of the proof that he had broken the law. In other words, he destroyed a tangible object to thwart a federal investigation. Well, in this 5-4 opinion, Justice Ginsburg holds that, in fact, fish are not tangible objects, um, at least for purposes of Section 1519, because, after all, um, tangible things can't mean all tangible things if you read it along in the list with records, documents, and other tangible things. Certainly, that can't mean everything. Um, Justice Kagan, writing for, wait for it, herself, Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, and Justice Alito, um, wrote a hilarious dissent um, that not only referred to Dr. Seuss um, to make the point that fish are indeed tangible objects, um, but made a number of puns and other um, clever, witty, sarcastic remarks about why the majority view made no sense. Um, in practice, what this means is that here is a federal criminal statute that will be given a fairly narrow compass, um, and as Justice Kagan pointed out toward the end of her dissent, that may be a good thing. We may believe that there is too much uh, federal law enforcement, that there's overcriminalization, but she says the way to fix that is not to adopt bizarre readings of statutes that make no sense. Um, it's a hilarious read. Um, it's lots of fun. Yates versus the United States. So that's number one. Um, all right. Uh, the second case, perhaps the most important whistleblower case the Supreme Court has heard in a while, uh, Department of Homeland Security versus McLean. Um, so Robert McLean was a TSA air marshal. Um, who basically leaked to the media in 2003 um, rather significant changes in air marshal coverage that he believed were um, a really bad idea that would expose um, a, a number of commercial airline flights um, to a much greater security risk. Um, he was fired for revealing to the media um, uh, uh, the security lapses, even though it actually worked. Um, as to say, his revelations embarrassed the TSA and forced them to change their program. Um, and McLean argued that he was protected from being fired by the Whistleblower Protection Act. This is the federal whistleblower statute. Um, and it has something called a covered disclosure, which is when you um, disclose something, uh, when you disclose uh, activity that is um, unlawful, fraudulent, or a threat to national security. Um, and McLean's argument was, I was disclosing a threat to national security, um, I was acting in good faith, I should be covered by the statute. Things get weird because this, that protection in the whistleblower statute doesn't apply if the disclosure is, quote, specifically prohibited by law. So that is to say, right, if it's, uh, if it's a crime to make the disclosure, if, say, you're disclosing classified information, um, right, then you can't claim whistleblower protection. Um, and that makes some sense. In McLean's case, his disclosure was not prohibited by a statute. It was prohibited by regulations, administrative regulations promulgated by the TSA um, and the Department of Transportation. And so the whole question of McLean was whether the specifically prohibited by law proviso um, applied to regulations too, right? Or whether it just applied to statutes. Um, and the Supreme Court unanimously held um, that it just applies to statutes. Um, that to be, um, for to be exempt from whistleblower protection, the disclosure must be specifically prohibited by Congress, then not just by administrative regulation. And then the court went on to explain why the Aviation and Transportation Security Act of 2001 did not specifically prohibit McLean's disclosure. It's a technical statutory interpretation case, but actually a pretty important bottom line for federal whistleblowers, um, that unless uh, the disclosure is prohibited by an act of Congress and not just an administrative regulation, um, you will be entitled to whistleblower protection under federal law. Uh, so that's TSA versus McLean. Um, and then last, Holt versus Hobbs. Um, this was a case about a state policy that prevented a Muslim prisoner from growing a half-inch beard in accordance with his religious beliefs. Um, and in Holt versus Hobbs, the court unanimously held that that policy violated something called the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, um, I love this acronym, real Yupa. Um, basically because um, the state did not have a sufficiently compelling justification um, for why even a half-inch beard posed a security threat. Um, in prison, they didn't have a strong enough penological interest. Um, all three of these cases are statutory interpretation cases. There's no big con law here. Um, but they all have potential significance um, for sort of 
life going forward, you might very well encounter efforts to amend all three of the statutes um, in these cases to overrule these decisions from different constituencies. Can you take questions on these before you get to the next question? Sure, I'll take questions whenever you have. Isn't McLean more important for the doctrine or the dicta that suggests that criminalization of conduct by regulation is suspect, given the fact that that seems to be the proliferation of the federal criminalization of everything through regulatory uh, pronouncements, not enactments? It's a, it's a great question. I, I think, I think it, may, it may sort of presage a move in that direction. Um, the thing is, it's such a specific question of statutory language, um, right? So the whole case, remember, in McLean was about the phrase specifically prohibited by law um, and what that meant in the, in the expressly specific context of the Whistleblower Protection Act. And indeed, the opinion in McLean is so focused on the Whistleblower Protection Act itself and on why Congress would have used those words, you know, specifically prohibited by law, as opposed to prohibited by law, regulations, etc. I could see the court in a different context not feeling bound by its specific reading of that statutory language. So you may be right, there may be a move in that direction. Um, I don't think there's enough in the opinion to prejudge a future case that's not about the whistleblower statute. If you add that to the dissent from particularly new credible justice in the Fish case about, quote, over-criminalization, one reads tea leaves out of at least their recognizing this concept of overcriminalization as they look at each of these different applications. Of I think that's right, although so the, the Justice Kagan's dissent in Yates is really interesting in what it may or may not foretell. Um, is there going to be some, there is not now any principle of statutory interpretation that says we should read criminal statutes narrowly because overcriminalization is bad. Uh, there's something called the rule of lenity, which is that ambiguities in criminal statutes ought to be resolved in favor of the defendant. Um, but that's not the same thing. Um, and so I guess I remain to be convinced that the other three justices who joined her dissent really believe um, that overcriminalization by itself is a reason to interpret statutes narrowly. Um, I suspect that they won't feel bound by that um, in a later case. Other questions about these three? I'm happy to, you know, do this informally. Yeah, come on. You know, the fish case, I was listening to that on the radio, and I understand that the destruction was after he had been arrested. So uh, it was after his ship had been seized, uh, right? So the Coast Guard stopped his ship. He threw the fish over the side of the boat. After, um, after they left. After they left. Um, because the idea was when he got into port, um, they inventoried the boat. Uh, or I'm sorry, they, sorry, I, I, I don't know my nautical terms. They would inventory the catch, um, right? And so if he didn't have this below weight fish in his catch when he got back to port, he wouldn't be breaking the law. Um, so it was, it was, in many ways, Yates is reminiscent of a case that you guys may remember from a couple of years ago about um, prosecuting a wife for a chemical weapons attack on her husband. Um, the Bond case, you guys might remember? Was that? So that was a good case. It was a good case. Um, but what, what Bond and Yates have in common is overzealous federal prosecutors with time on their hands. Um, right? It would have been easy enough um, to just try Yates for the underlying crime um, since they had evidence that he had thrown the fish overboard, as opposed to trying to prosecute him federally um, for obstruction. Um, but federal prosecutors, you know, they like to be creative. But that's an even more significant case because the agent instructed the fisherman to keep the catch and to take it into port. So in terms of destruction with purposefulness Indeed. Uh, and the color of law covering it. Except, except for the majority's conclusion that a fish is not a tangible object. <laughs> which. But they got there in part because they didn't like the case. That's right, that's right. Um, and, and I think, I mean, there's a lot to be said for that. I think Justice Kagan, it's hard to disagree with Justice Kagan that reading a, reading a, a statute that is rather plain in its meaning to mean something else is not the way to take out your frustration. But comment. Is the language other tangible items or tangible items? Uh, I'm sorry, it's tangible. So it's, it's records, documents, or tangible objects. 
The, I, I put the other in there in my description. Well, other would be important because it would say stuff like that. Right. No other. It wasn't too hard. <laughs> well, listen, Documents, this is, records. Guys, this is, this is why I'm telling you you should read Justice Kagan's dissent. She has lots of fun with how easy a case this ought to have been. Um, and she, she, she spares not that much. Um, uh, she does not pull her punches um, to, directed toward either Justice Ginsburg or Justice Alito's concurrence. Um, if anything, she's even harsher toward Justice Alito. Um, so it's, it's a fun read. Um, Steve, do you see any cases percolating in the, in the circuit courts that might bring up related issues um, concerning prosecutorial discretion and the interpretation of these? So there's one sense. big set of cases that I think we'll get to the court next year. Um, there's, there's a statute called, um, I'm going to butcher the name, I think it's the Armed Career Criminals Act, mm -hmm. ACCA, ACCA. Um, and this is a statute Congress passed to basically dramatically um, to, to create a whole bunch of new criminal offenses for basically being a convicted felon with, a, with, 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 with arms, um, right? So felon in possession um, and those kinds of things. Um, those statutes are so broad and they have been applied so broadly by federal prosecutors and there are now a series of challenges making their way through the circuits, um, basically challenging ACA on the whole and the specific provisions of it is unconstitutionally vague. Um, that is to say that the language is so unspecific, that an average criminal defendant can't really know what the crime is. Um, I suspect we will see those cases next term or shortly thereafter. Um, but, you know, there's a sort of latent hostility to ACCA in the courts that is separate from the broader questions of, you know, one-off statutes like 1519 and the Chemical Weapons Convention Implementation Act. Um, so I think we will see, um, periodically, more and more cases like this. Um, but I don't know that I don't know that's going to be. I, I don't think it's a trend. I think it's just a sort of a steady stream. Okay. Any other questions about these three before we move on to some of the other cases that have been argued but not yet decided? Or questions about just random questions about the Supreme Court? Why are there nine of them? There are no good reasons. There's a historical answer for why there are nine. Um, so, it, sorry, it used to be, uh, since I said it, um, so the Supreme Court was created had six justices, um, which, if you think about it, proves that the founders weren't really thinking about the safety of a divided body, because, you know, six is an even number. Um, I, I, I like to say in my federal courts class, six is an odd number for a court, but then, I, then the students are like, wait, it's an even number. Odd is an unusual. All right, we got to <laughs> So what happened was the Supreme Court, Ma Ma remembers this, all right. So um, as, as, the, as Congress created new circuit courts, each time they created a new circuit, they added a, 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 a seat to the Supreme Court. Um, so much so that by 1863, when Congress created the 10th Circuit, Congress actually created a 10th seat on the court. Um, but then uh, Congress didn't like President uh, Johnson so much, so they took away three seats. Um, and then when President Grant took over, they added two seats back, and they added two ever since 1869. So there you go. That's no, more than you agree. Yeah. Um, all right. So let me let me turn to cases already argued, um, and this is the largest category of cases I was planning to talk about today. Um, I would I want to talk specifically about eight of them. Um, I'm just going to go through them, but stop me at any point if you have questions about a specific one. And these are in order of when they were argued, um, and so for the most part, this may be predictive of when we should expect a decision. Um, that is to say, right, the cases that were argued longer ago stands to reason we'll get opinions in them sooner rather than later. Um, the most outstanding, the longest outstanding case is the Israeli passport case, uh, Zivotofsky versus Kerry. Um, this is in many ways the most interesting uh, separation of powers case the court has this term. Um, the question in Zivotofsky is whether Congress has the, well, let me, let me put it at a higher level of abstraction. The question in Zivotofsky is where is Jerusalem? There we go. I like to put it that way. Um, so let me ask you guys, where is Jerusalem? It's an international city. Oh, you're cheating. <laughs> How many of you want to say Israel? Good. That seems too easy. Um, where is Jerusalem? It's a metaphysical question. All right. Well, it has been the policy of the United States executive branch since 1952 that Jerusalem is not in Israel. Um, not since it's in another country, but because it's just easier to recognize, as Sarah said, that Jerusalem is an international city. Uh, this is why the U.S. Embassy to Israel is in Tel Aviv, not Jerusalem, um, doesn't piss off people. Um, 
In 2002, Congress, sorry, as a result of that policy, if U.S. citizen parents um, give birth to a baby in Jerusalem, the baby's passport will say Jerusalem and not Israel as the place of birth. Um, in 2002, Congress passed a statute, because this was obviously a critical issue in 2002, um, providing that if, in fact, the parents want the passport to say Jerusalem, comma, Israel, they have a statutory right to have the passport say Jerusalem, comma, Israel. Um, and the Zivotofskis sued on behalf of their then baby, now 37-year-old, um, not really, but, you know, now, what, 16, 17, 18-year-old child, um, arguing that his passport should say Jerusalem, comma, Israel. Um, the first time this case went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court reversed the lower court's holding that this was a non-justiciable political question. Basically, the Supreme Court said, nice try trying to not decide this case, lower courts, but no such luck, you actually have to decide this case. Um, and then on remand, the Court of Appeals to the D.C. Circuit held that this statute was unconstitutional because it violated the president's uh, exclusive um, Article II constitutional power to recognize foreign governments. Um, and so part of the power to recognize foreign governments, the D.C. Circuit said, includes the power to recognize where they are, and more importantly, where they are not. Uh, the Supreme Court granted cert um, and heard argument on November 3rd. Um, I don't know what they're going to say, other than that they probably wouldn't have granted if they agreed completely with the D.C. Circuit. Um, so it seems like there are a couple possibilities. One, passports do not implicate the recognition power. Right, so the court could say, um, yes, the president has exclusive and unilateral recognition power, but putting something on a passport doesn't trigger that power. Um, that would be a way to uphold the statute without narrowing the president's constitutional authority. Um, the court could also say Congress has some role to play in recognition, and so this is triggering the president's recognition power, but that power is not exclusive. Um, or, con or the court could say, yes, the statute is unconstitutional. Uh, those seem to be the three most likely outcomes. Don't ask me which one I think is going to happen. The oral argument was very confusing. Um, but that's the long without saying the case, Zivotofsky versus Perry. Any questions about that one? You guys are, are a, a lively audience. Okay. Um, next up is um, Alabama Legislative Black Caucus versus Alabama. Uh, this case was argued on November 12, 2014. Um, so this is an interesting testament to what happens after Shelby County. Um, so Shelby County, you may recall, is the very important case the Supreme Court decided, what, two years ago now, I want to say? Is that right, two years ago? Yeah. 2013. I'm so old. Um, and in Shelby County, the court uh, invalidated the preclearance formula in the Voting Rights Act, uh, which basically made it a lot harder for individuals to challenge state election law changes, state voting law changes, um, on statutory grounds, this is a constitutional challenge to the redistricting um, that Alabama engaged in after and as a result of the 2010 census. And the basic claim is that Alabama violated um, both the 14th and 15th Amendments by um, grouping uh, black voters in Alabama into what are called majority-minority districts. Um, that is to say, um, by drawing the lines in such a way to consolidate the power of minority group so that they would absolutely dominate one district um, and would have no ability to have sway in other districts. Um, the Supreme Court has suggested in the past that majority minority districts would violate the Equal Protection Clause, um, but as of late, the court has been far more skeptical um, about claims uh, for racial uh, gerrymandering without very, very clear proof of intent without very, very clear proof that the state was actually deliberately trying to uh, marginalize the minority group in question. Um, this case is a really interesting test of just how far the court has come on that question. Um, even if the court sides with the plaintiffs, um, what Alabama did was especially extreme, um, and so it may not be that important a precedent, but if the court sides with Alabama, um, that might open the door for other states to engage in similar gerrymandering without worrying about um, repercussions. Um, one complexity, one complicated factor, after the oral argument, um, the parties actually filed supplemental briefs on a question that really had only come up at the argument about how the data was calculated and how the districts were drawn. So it's possible the court will be scared off by those briefs from deciding the case this term. Um, and it could always do what they did in, for example, Citizens United and Kiobel, 
which is uh, set the case for re-argument next term in light of these new briefs. Um, so we may not see a decision in this case this term. Uh, that's Alabama Legislative Black Caucus. Question about what that would look like for election. Yes. Um, so if they hold, so if they set it for a rehearing, uh, like I'm just curious if it, if, if it like timing wise, right? Between the two um, yeah. Presumably, if they set it for a rehearing, um, it would be re-argued in September. Right. Um, so that was what they did with uh, Citizens United, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so a decision would presumably then still be out in time, at least for the primary races in Alabama. Um, right, it would probably screw up the calendar, but but it wouldn't totally destroy the calendar. It w but would it give enough time to this to, for gerrymandering? Um, I guess I mean the real question is right if if the court sides with the plaintiffs and orders Alabama to go back and try again. Right. Um, presumably, what will happen is they'll order the district court right to adopt some interim plan until and unless the Alabama legislature comes back and does something, um, and so the power is in the district court in the interim. How do you think this will impact congressional districts? Congressman Scott's district is uh, the federal district court in Richmond overturned it. Um, the Republicans in the delegation in Virginia challenged it. Um, it goes to direct appeal to the Supreme Court, and it's. I, think, I don't think they've decided on that whether or not they're going to take it yet. But. I think they were holding for the Alabama case. Okay. Um, I, I think it really depends on obviously what they rule and how they write it. Um, so there are lots of things about the Alabama case that make it especially egregious, which if you pay attention to Alabama politics, should surprise you all that much. Um, I hope no one here is from Alabama, or at least is it totally agree with me. <laughs> yes, I absolutely agree. Okay. Um, so um, how is it going to affect other cases? It really depends. Um, but it very well could affect other cases. I mean, this is probably, because of the Voting Rights Act, the Supreme Court had been able to avoid for a long time saying all that much about racial gerrymandering as a constitutional violation. Um, because most racial gerrymandering before, Shel before Shelby County could have been parsed and dealt with and litigated under the Voting Rights Act. Um, so almost whatever the court says is going to have implications for any other district where there's a plausible claim um, that this kind of majority-minority manipulation was going on. Um, the real question as with any gerrymandering case is going to be where the court thinks the line is between permissible gerrymandering and impermissible gerrymandering. Um, and I suspect from this court going to have something to do with the legislative intent um, and proving some kind of um, inappropriate discriminatory purpose on the part of the legislature. Other questions about that? All right, on the Facebook. Um, so the Supreme Court finally grapples with Facebook, but not really, in Alanis versus United States. Um, so the media portrays this as the Facebook case. Um, the media is stupid. Um, the fact that this case involves Facebook is a, um, how do I put this, irrelevancy. Um, but that's okay. All right. Um, so in Alanis, um, we have an individual who made a very threatening post on Facebook. That's where Facebook comes in. That's it. It has nothing to do with Facebook. That's where Facebook comes into this case. Facebook was the forum. It's like, you know, you could have put the post on a wall. Um, it would have been the same thing. Um, and the question is whether um, it's basically whether the federal statute that he was prosecuted for requires proof of his subjective intent to threaten the target of the, of the threat, um, or only proof that a reasonable person would regard the statement as threatening. So you guys see the difference? Right, so it's one thing to say, did you, Mr. Alanis, write this Facebook post with the intent of threatening the person you were talking about? Um, that's a high standard, right, because then you have to prove to a jury what Alanis really thought, um, versus could a reasonable, objective person have perceived this comment out of context as a threat? Right, that's a much lower standard. Uh, right, then we don't care what Alanis was actually thinking, all we care about is what a random person would have thought had they read that Facebook comment in the abstract. Um, and this actually, there's a circuit split on this in the Federal Courts of Appeals about whether the federal criminal statute at issue requires proof of subjective intent um, or only a uh, reasonable person. Um, backstopping the circuit split is the argument that the Constitution, to wit the First Amendment, requires proof of subjective intent, because otherwise it should be protected speech. Um, right? That is to say that if, if, unless you have a subjective intent to threaten, the argument goes, um, your speech should be protected by the First Amendment, even if an objective person would have perceived it as threatening. 
So what the court is deciding in this case is whether the federal statute requires subjective intent or just what a reasonable person would think, and if it's the latter, whether it's unconstitutional. It really has nothing to do with Facebook. It's also a nominee for one of the best, I think, amicus briefs that's been filed. True. In a case in a long time. And this was, I printed it out before we got here just because I wanted to make sure that I had captured everyone who was mentioned in the table of authorities, along with the Constitution and various relevant statutes. This is an amicus brief on behalf of the First Amendment Project and rap music scholars. And as some of you may know who are familiar with this case, the Facebook postings were sort of, you know, there's what the petitioner, or excuse me, I guess what the defendant in this case, now the petitioner was arguing was that this was sort of his artistic ranting against, I believe it was his ex-wife. It was poetry. Yeah. And so included in the table of authorities are references to, for instance, Eminem, NWA, Wu-Tang Clan, and Jay-Z. And so I don't know how often it gets put in court briefings, including those types of authorities. I'm going to go with never. I feel good about that. So we're going to have Dr. Seuss and Wu-Tang Clan in the same term. Right. Excellent. In a decision before the editorial. RB. RB. I guess this is how we get through the day. Anyway, this is a really important case for the First Amendment. It is not at all an important case for Facebook. So that's Alanis versus the United States. Any questions about that case from anybody? Well, it's also important for a number of criminal prosecutions in places like the District of Columbia that often rely on rap music and other kinds of material like that produced by people who ultimately become criminal defendants in cases like this. Totally agree. Although it's not a case about Facebook, has Facebook taken, has it taken any sort of stand on this issue and protected free speech? Not really, because this, I mean, this wasn't, no one argued that the post should be taken down, right? This wasn't a case where someone tried to take coercive action against Facebook. Okay. It's really just, I mean, the question, the only way that Facebook really matters here is we all might react differently to someone who writes something about us on Facebook, which might be embarrassing, but which we realize is a, you know, is a little bit different than someone who slips a handwritten note under our front door. Right. Right. I have to think that most of us would perceive the latter as far more threatening than the former. And so it's the nature of the medium, not the medium itself, that goes to why the standard, is it a subjective intent to threaten or to what a reasonable person would think, really matters in this case. All right. From Facebook to pregnancy. Excellent. I guess. So the next case in the order is Young v. UPS, United Parcel Service. So this is a really interesting case about the intersection between pregnancy and other forms of workplace discrimination. Basically, the question in Young, Young was a woman who was pregnant while working for UPS, and she requested accommodations because there were certain heavy acts of manual labor that she wasn't able to perform due to her pregnancy. It wasn't that she needed time off from work. It was that there were certain things she couldn't do on the job. And she argued that a federal statute, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, required an employer not to treat her specially because of her pregnancy-related quote-unquote disability, but to treat her the same way as it would treat someone who wasn't pregnant but who had a similar disability. So imagine a middle-aged man who throws his back out and who therefore could not lift heavy boxes for a certain period of time. Young's argument is if the employer makes accommodations for that guy, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act requires the employer to make accommodations for her as well. The Federal Appeals Court in Richmond, the Fourth Circuit, said no. Nice try. And the Supreme Court granted certiorari. The argument did not go very well for Young, so it's possible the court's going to affirm and say no, in fact, the PDA does not require similar accommodations, or perhaps just that she didn't prove enough in the district court to show that she was entitled to similar accommodations. We might see a remand for more fact-finding in the district court. But I think it's an interesting opportunity for Congress to revisit the relationship between the PDA and, among other things, the Americans with Disabilities Act and how those intersect in the workplace, regardless of what the court holds. So that's Young. You guys are like, this is the most boring term ever. Where's gay marriage? We're getting there. So sometimes, the next case, sometimes small towns do really stupid stuff. That's the subtitle of the next case. 
Um, so the town of Gilbert, which I believe is in Arizona, don't quote me on that, um, they have a rather weird um, uh, town code when it comes to public signage. Um, and the code basically goes like this. If you're advertising for something that's non-religious, your sign can be yay big, I think it's 24 by 30 or something like that. But if it's a religious advertisement, it must be smaller. Um, I don't think you have to be a common law professor to have like alarm bells going on. Like, wait, you're treating religious speech worse and like categorically less valuable than non-religious speech? That seems like a free exercise clause problem. Um, shockingly, it probably is. Um, so the Supreme Court took this case to decide whether indeed it violates the free exercise clause for a town to impose different size requirements for religious signs compared to non-religious signs. Um, basically, I mean, the, what's weird about this case is that the court usually requires at least some indication that there was some illicit, improper religious motive or anti-religious motive for the, for the law. Um, and there's no evidence of that here. It's just a stupid old law that, you know, there may have been a motive for, but there's no evidence of. Um, but I suspect the court will strike it down anyway, because that just seems unnecessary. And it wasn't necessarily religious speech per se. They were all direction signs, I believe. Right. Well, this is right. when you get to the church. You're right. The but, so, right. So, Those so, had to be smaller than so St. Luke's Church, right? Uh, Bob's Liquor Store, right? Um, different size requirements. Um, I don't think any of the justices find that especially compelling. As a legal argument. All right, so that's uh, Reed versus Town and Gilbert. Um, the next case is a case called williams Uly versus the Florida Bar. This is actually an interesting and bit of a sleeper case. Um, about how the Supreme Court approaches state court judges. So, um, I don't know how many of you guys have been following the travails of retired Justice O'Connor, um, but she's basically made it her mission since she left the court um, to campaign against elected judges. Um, obviously, we don't elect federal judges, um, but I think it's 30 some odd states now elect at least some of their judges. And Justice O'Connor thinks it's a really bad idea. Um, and part of why is because if you have elections for judges, that means judges have to campaign. Um, and what would a judge campaign on?